follow that. <laughs> In 2020, higher education was hit by an earthquake that moved fast and broke things. The we have combined forces today with uh, Have I Got Tell for You to share you some perspectives from a life in educational technology in 2020. We heard in the last program about the scenes from before the quake. Uh, this were issues like the rise of accessibility considerations, the ongoing uh, dominance of big VLEs, learning analytics, and questions around degree apprenticeships. We're going to go now to some of the uh, impressions that you've given us about uh, life as a uh, a learning technologies yourselves and uh, within the sector. Oh, let's see if we can get the right screen share. What have your experiences been like uh, in the last three months, which we could talk about as the quake itself? We can see that it's been exhilarating, tiring, exhausting, challenging. In many ways, it's been frustrating and demanding. It's been a roller coaster. Uh, but it's also been collaborative, uh, it's been productive, it's been character building, uh, it's had things to do with leggings and dogs uh, as well. So there are all manner of uh, different, uh, different ways that you might have experienced uh, the quake itself uh, during the dramatic uh, moments that hit higher education uh, beginning in March of 2020. I where I am now. <laughs> okay. We're going to go uh, next to... Higher education, though, has been disrupted before. This is not the first time that uh, higher education has been disrupted. If we look at a uh, period of the bubonic plague um, during the Middle Ages, we can see that uh, although there were obviously wider population declines at the time, uh, higher education did see a uh, longer term uh, enrollment increases. So Oxford, for example, uh, set up uh, new college. Cambridge ex established uh, four new colleges during this period. We also found a shift from the more theological worldview of universities at the time to a more slightly more science-based one, which uh, led somewhat towards the Enlightenment at the time. During World War I, of course, um, we also had a further period of disruption to higher education. And um, uh, before the war, we found that universities were largely private institutions that were somewhat dependent on uh, fee income and uh, philanthropy. University contributions to war efforts, uh, such as uh, staff and students uh, signing up to fight the war related research, did lead to financial crises. And uh, ultimately, these led to uh, universities and governments being drawn into uh, closer relationships with each other. Um, World War I also saw an increase in uh, female teachers and things like changes in courses offered, uh, such as uh, modern languages like French or Russian. So we can see that while higher education has been profoundly disrupted in the past, it has also tended to uh, evolve uh, and change as a result. So we talked a little bit about before the quake, and these were the uh, the known knowns of what the uh, uh, what the landscape was like before the uh, before the quake.
earthquake hit. Um, let's go over to you now to talk about the current situation as well. We also heard from the panel about their experiences of uh, lockdown itself and the summer the last few months. So we're going to go over to you now, and this is uh, a time for a little bit of audience input here. Um, I have a question for each of you, and we'll give you a little bit of time to think about that and add your questions. You'll see them coming through live as well. My question for you all is, what one thing, we're thinking of the coming academic year that was uh, due to start shortly, what one thing are you or your institution putting in place to effectively support teaching, learning, or assessment for the coming year? I'll take a, uh, take a minute to get some responses in there as they come in. And it is something that you're also able to, as you can see, uh, add full sentences as well. Welcome to add more than one comment if you feel the urge. And do note the uh, effectively support part of the question. Panic is natural for each and every one. Mm -hmm. Riding the wings of chaos. That's a beautiful embracing of the, <laughs> the pending academic year. Somebody is enabling hybrid seminars. That's a, that's a bold move. We have a new framework for teaching and learning that is focusing on synchronous over synchronous, over uh, asynchronous over synchronous. Right, there we go. We'll, uh, we'll keep that open uh, for the time being anyway. So somebody's going for a CMOLT as well. Perfect thing to do. Okay. So um, I'd, I'd like to introduce uh, an idea that um, I brought to the ALT 2019 conference at Edinburgh. Um, the idea of speculative design may be familiar to some of you. Uh, we introduced this at uh, Edinburgh last year as we call speculative learning design. Speculative design takes the notion of possible futures. Uh, uses uh, ideas generated to better understand the present and to discuss the kinds of ideas that people actually want or not in the future. Uh, usually this takes the form of scenarios and uh, often it starts with a what if question. You'll see some of these in a moment. Essentially this is using design as a critical tool. It's not about predicting the future but it's imag about imagining what possible futures there might be. Now, speculative design comes from uh, uh, two London-based artists called Dunn and Rabi. Uh, they have uh, wrote a great book called Speculative Everything, published in 2013. Um, they've, uh, they, they've found in their research this uh, potential futures as a frame or a motif for thinking about speculative design and uh, develop, uh, developed it themselves to suit their own purposes. Um, if you look at the different components of this, um, and you can see that it starts out with the present on the left hand side and stretches out to uh, the probable, which is what is likely to happen, the plausible, which is what could happen, the possible, which is what might happen, and somewhere in there as well we have the preferable, which is what we want to happen. So bear these different options and possibilities uh, in mind. Um, obviously, speculative learning design um, simply would apply these principles and these uh, design objectives, ideas, uh, to possible educational futures. Now, one of the ways that we uh, that helps us to think about these uh, sort of speculative design ideas is taking a look at the state of the art or sort of current social trends. 
So um, I, I've re, re uh, showing a slide that we used again at uh, Edinburgh last year that shows some technical, some social, some positive, some uh, negative uh, social trends or technical trends in some cases. Uh, uh, interestingly, re after revisiting this slide, uh, I noticed that uh, global pandemics uh, is uh, uh, all in there as well. So uh, I'm not sure that any of us in uh, Edinburgh in uh, September last year, when we were talking about holographic academics, would have quite expected this degree of change that has been visited upon us. So um, that's it from me. I'm going to hand over to you. And uh, uh, Julie's going to be helping me uh, with, the, uh, with the breakout room uh, ideas as well. So we talked about before the quake, which was the, uh, the tell landscape before the lockdowns and coronavirus hit. Uh, global higher education. We talked about during the quake, and uh, you've contributed to that yourselves, which are your ideas and perspectives for uh, the challenges that you have had. Um, now, keen-eyed amongst you will uh, notice a, a third Rumsfeldism uh, coming here as well. We're also going to think about the unknown unknowns here uh, as well. The unknown unknowns, and this is thinking somewhat into the future. This is thinking about a post-COVID world. What does higher education look like in a post-COVID world? Now, I'm not going to uh, specify a time frame there. It could be uh, five years, it could be 10, it could be 20. But we're going to put you into small groups and um, you will have a single prompt in that group, uh, which is uh, at the top of the page, um, and I'd like you to use that prompt, uh, open up a discussion between yourselves in the group, and use that prompt to generate ideas for higher education institutions in the post-COVID era. So it's a sort of ideation board or, 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 or um, uh, uh, thought showering, I think is the current uh, uh, appropriate expression. Um, Aim for pos positive ideas if you can, but uh, obviously uh, we're talking big themes, big topics here. Uh, you, you might have all sorts of um, difficult question questions to throw in there as well. Now, uh, to keep it narrow, you could think about uh, teaching, learning and assessment in a post-COVID environment. Um, but welcome to also include any other ideas around higher education as well. And just to give everybody a, a, a Give you, spare you some time on deciding who does what. The person in your breakout group whose name comes first in the alphabet according to the Blackboard listing will be typing up the ideas from the discussion in the Padlet board. And uh, Julie has shared the Padlet link into the chat. Um, you can see it there, padlet.com slash dompate slash after the quake. So um, I hope that the instructions are clear. Uh, Julie, would you like to send our participants into their breakout rooms, please? Okay. And Julie and I will find ourselves joining in from. We'll. we'll, we'll okay, you should be going to the rooms now. The room. Hey Dom, it's just you, me and Maren in the main room now. How are we doing so far? Not too bad. I think some of the, the groups are now a lot lower than they were when I set them up. But I thought, did it go in automatically as well? Yeah, they've all gone in. Cool, let me know. I'm here. Let me know if you need anything. We'll do. Okay. Is my mic coming out all right? Yep. Right, I'll, go and, I'll, I'll go and there. join group four because uh, quite a few of them are down to like two participants now. <laughs> oh, <nice>. <laughs> so I'll go and join group four. Okay. 
feel free to join the group if you wish, man. Thank you. Will do. I'll also um, keep an eye on the chat in case anybody has any technical questions. wander into some of these rooms as well. So.
the biggest thing. Oh, we return <laughs> okay. to the main room. Okay, I think we are back into the main room uh, again here. Uh, I'm hoping that that's all. Right. Are we all back? Yeah, right, yeah. Okay, so let's go for a final share of some of what we would have seen today. Uh, we've got a few Padlet lips. A few responses coming in. So, uh, plenty of stuff from Group 1. Um, the problem of universally good internet access would need to be solved for people working from home. It certainly wouldn't be as much fun. Um, what if the pandemic kills off in-person exams? Um, the idea of trusting our adult learners is an idea. Uh, what if hybrid teaching becomes a preferred operating model for most universities and colleges? Uh, we certainly need to overcome some of the challenges. Um, let's take one more as well. What if global heating continues to rise? This is group six. We certainly need more flexible systems regardless of the pandemic. So, I think this is working. I think this is sharing on. Right. So, um, there we go. I'm going to, have to stop sharing that one. I'd like to uh, thank you all very, very much for your participation in this today. I know it took a, a very different turn from Have I Got Tell for you. Um, but uh, we've given you very different perspectives on the year today. Now, the Padlet link itself will uh, will remain open. And the intention is, is that uh, we'll follow up on this uh, with a blog post to uh, aggregate your, your respective responses on, the, um, uh, on uh, our Learning at City blog at City University. And um, if Alt would like the uh, a version of the blog post uh, as well, then we could get the conversation started there. Yeah.